Good morning, everyone. You know, that's a, it's very dangerous to get such a generous introduction because now your expectations have been raised so high. You will all be disappointed this morning. <laughs> but I, I am very happy uh, to be here. And I must say, I'm very impressed. Eh? This is Saturday morning, right? <laughs> And to see such a large group of people coming here on a Saturday morning shows that actually most Singaporeans know a good deal when they see it. I mean, how many firms in Singapore or in the world believe in zero management fee, right? It's actually quite a risky proposition, but it shows you that aggregate is being led by three, what I call three brave musketeers, Eric, Kevin, and Siak Eng. So a special round of applause for the three of them. <laughs> and let's hope that they continue to succeed and thrive uh, in the coming years. But let me begin by assuring you that uh, I'm not the guy who's going to speak to you on investment matters. But what I hope to do uh, in the time allotted to me is to give you a good sense of where our world is heading. And we live actually in extremely interesting times. You know, I'm 70 years old. And I can say with great confidence, eh? never in my 70 years have I seen a world as interesting as the one we are experiencing today. So that's what I try, I'll try to explain to you. And what I'll do is divide my remarks uh, into three parts. In part one, I'm going to explain to you the assumptions that I bring in trying to understand the world of today. In part two, I'll speak about the US-China geopolitical contest, which, by the way, is probably going to be the biggest geopolitical contest since human history began. It's an amazing drama that's going to unfold. And then in part three, I'll conclude by explaining why I still remain optimistic for the future. So let me, let me begin um, with part one to explain the assumptions that I bring to the table. And there are three uh, assumptions. Assumption number one is that the world is going to get better and better and better. Now, this may seem very strange to you. Fortunately, there's a lot of data that backs this up. I think some of you, I understand, have read my book, Has the West Lost It? And as you know, the book begins by describing how much the world has improved uh, in the last few decades. Three examples. First example, in the area of war and peace, which is in some ways the most critical dimension of human welfare, right? Your chances of dying in an interstate war is the lowest it's ever been since human history began. And that's quite amazing, you know? For most of human history, most societies live on the verge of conflict. Today, interstate conflict is disappearing. And that is shown in the, the data of a number of people dying in deaths. is going down and down and down. The second piece of good news. Since human history began, and especially since the end of World War II, We've been trying to eradicate extreme poverty. And in 1950, which by the way is not too long ago, it's two years after I was born, 
75% of humanity was suffering from extreme poverty. 75%. Today is less than 10%. And you can go down to zero by 2030. And I can tell you when future historians look at our time, they will say this is amazing. No period of human history succeeded in eradicating poverty, but we did it. Our generation did it. And the third piece of good news, which also explains my optimism, is that the global middle class population, which includes, by the way, all of you, is exploding from 1.8 billion in 2010 to 3.2 billion in 2020 to 4.9 billion in 2030, which means by 2030, more than half the world's population is going to enjoy huge improvements uh, in their living condition by joining the middle class. So that's, again, another amazing change in human history. And so people looking back at our times will say these are the best of times. Second assumption I bring to the table is that the chemistry of the world is going to change because we're going to go to, to what I call the Asian century. And I call it the return of Asia and not the rise of Asia because one of the most important facts of history we all need to know is that from the year one to the year 1820, for 1800 out of the last 2,000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. And it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off and North America took off. So if you view the past 200 years of world history against the backdrop of the past 2,000 years of world history, the past 200 years of world history have been a major historical aberration. Now, all aberrations come to a natural end. And that's what's happening now. And it's happening incredibly fast, right? If you look at it in purchasing power parity terms, in 1980, China's GNP was less than 10% of the United States. By 2014, 34 years later, it had become bigger. And if you look at it in nominal terms, America's GNP was eight times the size of China in the year 2000. Today is 1.5 times. What an amazing transformation is happening in this world. So the Asian century is coming. That's the second assumption. And my third assumption, which in a sense reflects what I said in the first and two points, is that the world today is changing very fast. Faster than we imagine, faster than we planned for. And it's important to bear this in mind because if you want to understand in a very fundamental way why we are getting strange phenomenon like the election of Donald Trump, in 2016, and why we are having these troubles with Brexit. All these troubles are a result of the failure of critical elites, especially in the developed world, in America, in Europe, to explain to their people, hey, the world is changing. We have to change, we have to adapt. So just to give you a concrete example, since I'm talking a lot about US and China, in the year 2001, when China joined the WTO and suddenly injected 900 million new workers 
into the global capitalist system, you would naturally get what a famous European economist, Joseph Schampita, said. You would get creative destruction. Jobs would be lost, and jobs were lost. And so the populations in America and Europe got angry. And that's how Donald Trump got elected in 2016. There is a connection. So if you don't pay attention to the fundamental changes, you get into trouble. And what is especially bizarre, and I'm only going to make a passing mention of this, is that if you had asked me, even until 10 years, 15 years ago, which country is the most sensible country on planet Earth, I could have voted for the British, right? And I remember as a child, when I was born in a British colony here in 1948, and I lived under the British for at least 15 years as a British subject on my birth certificate, you had the impression that the British were this incredibly clever, superior race. 100,000 Englishmen could rule 300 million Indians in India effortlessly. They were so amazing. And today, the most sensible country on planet Earth, literally, may be on the verge of committing national suicide by undertaking an experiment which is very dangerous. Now, hopefully, Brexit will not happen. But the fact that it, the, the, just the sheer possibility that it could happen in two or three weeks' time is an indication how things have gone so badly wrong in the world. So that's what happens when you don't pay attention to the fundamental changes in the world. So all this now brings me to the most fundamental change happening in the world, which is, of course, the geopolitical contests between the United States and China. And I can tell you that it will be a very difficult contest to understand, because it will be a multi-dimensional contest. The US and China will be competing in so many areas, and each of these areas will be complex in its own right. And therefore, trying to figure out what's really happening is not going to be easy. But the way I can be helpful to you is to tell you to look at some significant dimensions that will guide the US-China struggle. And by the way, I'm writing a book on the subject, and I hope to finish it by June this year. And one thing I discovered that the best way to understand a problem is to write a book about it. Because in the process of writing the book, you actually learn quite a bit. So I'm, what I'm sharing with you is an advanced indication of what my book is going to say in June. So what I do in this book is to discuss five dimensions of US-China rivalry. First dimension, economic. Second dimension, political. Third dimension, military. Fourth dimension, cultural. Fifth dimension, primacy. And I'll explain what primacy is. So let's go dimension by dimension. Now, the economic dimension of the struggle you have already seen, right? Donald Trump has launched a trade war against China. He has raised tariffs on Chinese goods. The Chinese have retaliated. Donald Trump has counter-retaliated. And right now, as you know, they're busy discussing the outcome, how to solve this problem. And it's ongoing. In fact, this week, by the way, Xi Jinping was supposed to meet uh, Donald Trump in Florida to try and solve this problem. There must have been a hiccup. It's not happening. So that's an ongoing thing. But the big question is, who is right 
And who is wrong in this trade dispute? And then again, here too, there's no simple answer. Because if you talk to the economists, for them it's very simple. Donald Trump is wrong. Bilateral trade deficits are not the result of China cheating in any way. Bilateral trade deficits are the result of economic competitiveness of different economies. And you never solve a bilateral trade deficit through raising tariffs. And I can tell you, in preparation for my book on US-China relations, I spent last year on sabbatical. I went to six universities. I spent time in Harvard. I met the best trade economists in Harvard, Robert Lawrence. And he said, Donald Trump's views on trade are all nonsense. If, he, if Donald Trump set for a first year economics 101 trade economics exam, he will fail. But yet he's president. But what's shocking is this. Even though his policy is completely wrong, he is getting a tremendous amount of support from the, from the American body politic. And you all know how divided America is today. In fact, in all, the, in all my years of observation of America, and I've been going there for three to four decades, I've never seen America as divided and as polarized as it is today. But there's only one issue that brings together the Democrats and the Republicans. They come together to support Trump to bash China. Now that's a very telling indicator. The policy is flawed, but the people support Trump. Why? And here, again, in my book, I'm going to explain how China made a huge strategic mistake in the last 20 to 30 years. And as you know, and I've said, described to you, China has done very well, as you know, in the past three decades. But in the process of doing very well, they also became somewhat arrogant. And as they became arrogant, they alienated a very important constituency in the US-China relationship, which was the American business community. And by the way, it's actually very difficult to alienate businessmen because businessmen are not interested in politics. They are only interested in profits. So if they make good profits, they'll be happy with you. And yet, the American business community, including firms that were making money in China, began to turn against China. And the reasons are, again, complicated. They felt that China was competing unfairly, giving subsidies to Chinese firms, taking away intellectual property from American firms, and so on, so, so on, so forth. So the net result of this is that when Donald Trump launched his trade war against uh, China, the American business community, which in the past used to say, no, 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 don't launch a trade war against China, I will lose. Today, the American business community is keeping completely quiet and say, go ahead, bash China. And that's why the situation is as bad as it is on the economic front. So the big question, therefore, is how will this turn out? What will be the result? And here, again, you cannot predict what the result is going to be because it is not clear what the game is. Now, if there are two possible games at play here. In the first game, if America wants to reduce trade deficits with China, it can be done. The Chinese are more than willing to buy more soya bean. They'll even buy the Boeing planes that nobody wants to buy nowadays. Right? So 
they will make concession after concession and they have offered it to reduce the trade deficit. And the Chinese actually thought that that would work, that would solve the problem. But that is only if it's game A, but it could be game B. Now what is game B? There are a lot of strategic thinkers in America who think that it will be very dangerous for America to become the number two economy in the world. So they're thinking of ways and means of slowing down China's growth. And how do they think they're going to slow down China's growth? They believe that the best way to slow down China's growth is to gradually decouple the Chinese and American economies. So for these strategic thinkers, the game is not about trade deficits. It's about how you detach the two economies. And if you want to detach the two economies, you don't want to deal. And that's why you cannot be sure whether a deal will take place. But at the end of the day, if you ask me to take a bet, I would take a bet that some kind of deal will take place. And I'll tell you why. Because in the Donald Trump administration, what is really strange is that the most pragmatic member of the Donald Trump administration is Donald Trump. And he, at the end of the day, because he's concerned about getting re-elected, he wants to make sure that the polls make him look good. He wants to make sure that the economy does okay, so he may make a deal. But I must say he's a tough negotiator, and so it will take, there'll be lots of bounces on the road before we come to a deal. That's only one dimension. Now let me turn to the second dimension. And I'm looking at the clock, so I better hurry up. <laughs> I think I'm talking too much. On the political side, the second, second uh, area of contestation is a much harder area to find a solution because in economics, as you know, at the end of the day, you can have a win-win solution. You win, I win. You make money, I make money. So we make a deal. But politics is a zero-sum game. And here, the Americans, because of their exceptional success over the last 200 years, have assumed that in human history, there's only one road to take. As countries grow, as they develop, they become more democratic. And indeed, when America began its policy of engagement with China, American leaders, including Bill Clinton, said, hey, Let's engage China, let's trade with China, let's open up the Chinese economy. If we open up the Chinese economy, we open up Chinese society. If we open up Chinese society, China will become democratic. And trust me, very senior, thoughtful, well-informed Americans believe this. So they had this expectation, hey, China's GNP growing, growing, growing. China has become more and more and more democratic. But as you know, the opposite has happened. China has been growing, growing, growing. China has been becoming more democratic. In fact, the Chinese Communist Party is becoming stronger and stronger. And Xi Jinping has just announced there will be no more term limits on him. And I can tell you that event triggered a tremendous amount of anguish in Americans saying, what happened? China is supposed to become democratic like us. It's not. And that also explains why even so what I call progressive, open-minded American thinkers have become disillusioned with China. So the question is, is it fair? 
for the Americans to have, these, have this expectation. And the, one of the points I'm going to make in my book is, why is it America, a country which is only 250 years old, less than 250 years old, with only 300 over million people, the Americans think that they know better what is for China, which probably has a 3,000 year history and a population four times larger. And Chinese history has taught the Chinese people something very fundamental, that when the center is weak, the people suffer because there's chaos. But when the center is strong, the people are better off. So from the point of view of Chinese history, when you have a strong leader, it's good for the country. And so at the time when the Chinese people say, hey, good, we have a strong leader, the Americans are saying, what's wrong with you? Why don't you get rid of your strong leader? So you can see this clash here of different views. And this one, I expect the misunderstanding between US and China will continue to grow on the political front. It will not be easily resolved anytime soon. The third area where you're going to get very dangerous competition is in the military dimension. And by the way, throughout history, when the world's number two power, which today is China, is about to overtake the world's number one power, that's the point in time when you can get war between number one and number two. And indeed, a Harvard professor I met in Harvard, Graham Allison, has actually come up with a book. It's called Destined for War, and he predicts in his book, and he literally says, war is more likely than not between US and China. So let me give you some good news. There'll be no war, for sure, because and here, for, uh, uh, paradoxically, we can thank nuclear weapons for this because if you have a war between US and China and it escalates to a nuclear war, you have two losers and no winners. So if the US and China go to war, India will win, Russia will win, Japan will win, US and China will lose. So that's not going to happen. But despite that, there will be close shaves. And you can see in the South China Sea, and frankly, this is why Singapore has got to watch this situation very closely, because we may get tugged into this inadvertently. So we've got to watch this area very carefully and do our best to persuade the US and China not to have too many dangerous uh, maneuvers against each other. And here I'm going to mention in passing, okay, I'm going to give you mention a few points that you should watch carefully. If there's one flashpoint that's very dangerous, South China Sea is one of them, but Taiwan is even more dangerous. Because as you know, from the point of view of the Chinese people, Taiwan was taken away by China during the century of humiliation by the Japanese in 1895, and the Chinese want to get Taiwan back they're not going to get it back anytime soon. But if Taiwan declares independence, then the chances of war become very high. So this is an issue that you've got to watch very carefully. And you see, up to now, all American governments have been very careful on the Taiwan issue. But the Trump administration could be playing dangerous games on the Taiwan issue, and that's a point of danger you got to watch. Now, the fourth dimension is the cultural dimension. And this is, in some ways, the hardest dimension to speak about, because everything I've said to you so far has been on the assumption that the United States is a rational actor, China is a rational actor, and you have two rational actors trying to find deals 
and accommodations with each other. But in the cultural dimension, we're going to deal with something that is subconscious and that is buried in the imagination. And here it is a fact that going back hundreds of years, there has been in the Western imagination a deep fear of something which I call the yellow peril. Now, no Westerner will ever speak about the yellow peril. They will deny that it exists. But the yellow peril is like the invisible elephant in the room. It's there. It's playing a role. It's influencing decisions, but you can't talk about it. And that dimension is going to be very difficult for US and China to manage in the coming years. And then the fifth dimension that they'll have to deal with is what I call the primacy dimension. And what do I mean by the primacy dimension? Now, the United States has got very used to being number one for a very long time. And it's almost impossible for Americans to think of becoming number two. And I know this from first-hand experience because many years ago, maybe five years ago, I was invited to go to Davos to chair a forum on the future of American power. And there I was on the stage, like a stage like this. And next to me, there were two American senators, Conger and Chambliss. There was a New York Congresswoman, Nita Lowy, and a very senior American official, Mike Froman. So I asked these four panelists a question. What, what do you see? What do you see as the future of American power? He said, oh, we'll be number one. We'll be number one. We'll be number one. So I scratched my head. I said, you know, I've seen some data that says maybe within 10 years, 15 years, China's GNP could become bigger. So how will America react? And their answers shocked me. Their answers were, oh, we'll be number one. We'll be number one. But luckily, Senator Cocker, who sadly stepped down, he was the smartest of the lot. He said, Mr. Chairman, I can do the maths. I can see where you're taking us. I'm not going there. Because for any American politician to have words coming out of his mouth saying, oh, America will become number two, he's dead. It's politically suicidal in America for any American politician to speak of becoming number two. But just look at this. It is inevitable. It's going to happen. But you can't speak about it in the land of free speech in America. So it's going to create, quite obviously, a big problem when it happens. So you can see and I've gone through all the five dimensions, the economic, the political, the military, the cultural, the primacy dimension. This is going to be a very complicated and difficult subject to follow. So the question, therefore, is looking ahead, and this is my last part of my remarks, should we be optimistic or pessimistic? Now, on the basis of what I've said so far, I suspect you're all feeling somewhat pessimistic. So let me tell you why you should be op uh, optimistic. And there are three potential reasons for being optimistic. And here, as you know, it said, I, I, I'm not a Chinese speaker, that the Chinese word for crisis is a combination of two characters, danger, an opportunity. And in moments of crisis, there are also opportunities. And let me mention three opportunities. The first opportunity is that China's leaders realize 
that in many ways the great contest with the United States has begun. It started already. So China's priorities today must be that if I'm going to focus on the United States, I'm going to make peace with all my neighbors. I'm going to make peace with Japan, I'm going to make peace with India, I'm going to make peace in Southeast Asia. And so relations in this region, now that's unusual. We have the world's fastest growing power in our region, but we need not necessarily have instability in our region. And it's also possible, indeed likely, that China will make concessions to its neighbors and especially to ASEAN. And if I can just make one point in one line, one of the saddest aspects of many people in Singapore is that they're not aware that ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, on which, by the way, I also wrote a book called The ASEAN Miracle. ASEAN is a geopolitical umbrella given to Singapore. It took us 50 years to build that umbrella. It's a very valuable umbrella. Use it because ASEAN is going to get all kinds of dividends from China, even from the US, from Europe and other powers. So we are at the center of ASEAN, Singapore. We can benefit from some of these division, dividends. And you've seen this uh, in the trade agreements that Singapore has signed and so on and so forth. So that's one area of opportunity. The second area of opportunity is that China